Uh, my name is Herbert Mitchley. I uh, am really into electronic music a great deal. I teach at, this, at Stephen F. Austin State University. The classes that I teach is the history of rock and roll, uh, the history of jazz, guitar. I used to teach a lot of electronic music classes there as well. And uh, uh, I always had this interest in using old technology. And one of the things that I love about old technology is that sometimes less is more. Sometimes when you have all these different options, it gets really confusing. And these 8-bit boxes that they had back in the day uh, really can do anything that a modern com computer can do, except slower. Uh, and the old adage from computer land is that a 1-bit computer can do anything a bazillion-bit computer can do, just slower. That's, the, that's, the, that's it. So with 8 bits, there was a lot of things that we could do. Um, I mentioned this in the other uh, session, is that obviously the phone here is a lot more powerful than uh, the, the computer they sent to space. And the joke is always that your watch has a more powerful computer than the one they sent to, to, to space. And in some ways, that's, that's kind of true. However, it was, an inter, it was an integrated computer. It was done for one task to get you to navigate you to the moon. And it was also crash proof. I believe the software was w actually wired in with wires. So uh, anything, that, they, that thing could literally crash and still work. You know, how often, you know, would you trust your life to a cell phone to get you to the moon and back without it crashing? And I think most of us probably wouldn't even trust our laptops and things like that. So, um, and obviously there's, there's a, you know, a lot more computers on the ground that were talking back and forth to them as well. But we're gonna focus on the Commodore 64 and I've been using MIDI for a really long time. Uh, as a young um, music student, uh, I think well, a composition student, a lot of folks that probably have the same um, things that I, I face, it's very tough to get musicians to play. And I saw, hey, here's some, using the computer, you can play back some of my music and make sure it's perfect or, or done before I, I print out parts and give them to musicians to play. And of course, all the MIDI music back in the day, we are, now it's kind of laughable what we used to, get, we used to do back in 90, uh, 91, 89, and whatnot like that. I go back to 80, you know, 83 and whatnot. So the Commodore 64 really initially was, wasn't used, uh, didn't use MIDI. Um, it, was, it was designed right before MIDI came out, the NASM conference. And I got to, uh, don't feel like you have to read all of this here, and I'll, I'll kind of just sum up a little bit about uh, what this research is. Uh, and basically, the summer of uh, 2017, I wanted to make a CD of uh, music made from the Commodore 64. It took me years to compile everything together to get to this point. Um, one of the things was the, a MIDI interface. Um, they're not on eBay there very often. The MIDI interface I bought for $50 came from Germany. And uh, I actually got another one, I think, for $35 for, um, from, the, I, I think, in the US. And it was, it was uh, I had a, a body Commodore 64 used at a, at a Goodwill. And I, I had that for years, saying, yeah, I want to make some music with this thing. And I saw they had some cartridges, but I wanted to, to actually make music like you would have made in 1982, 1983. And uh, part of this is what I call computer archaeology, is that you have these old boxes, this old technology, and what can you do with these uh, computers? Um, and I, I kind of do the same thing with, with uh, old synthesizers. I, I made a, a year before this, I made a, a CD using a, a uh, Roland synthesizer, mm -hmm. uh, basically this patch bays and stuff like that. And this one, I actually got a more modern one, a Moog one, uh, and, and played around with that and just kind of see where, what's easier, what's the pros and cons about using this technology and, and, and whatnot. And uh, I wanted to record this CD because uh, live, like I would have done back in 82. So back, that, back at that point there, all I would have really had would have been a tape recorder. I wouldn't have had any way to edit the uh, audio. So basically, if I made a mistake, I just went back and re-recorded it. And um, I did record into the computer just to make, make it easier in some aspect. But basically, I just, I just treated it as a tape recorder. I didn't go and edit anything. There it was. So um, that was, I thought that was something interesting. And sometimes the obstacles helps your creativity a great deal. I, a lot of times with uh, uh, some students I talk to, young people I talk to, they have all these different you know, sounds and VSTs and all this here. They got to get this, well, this microphone or this type of doll or whatever, and they never make anything. Where if you just take a, take a, have a tape recorder and your guitar, you can record something. At least you got something that's there. And I think even though we have all these bells and whistles today, 
it, it really is how you can use something to, to, to make something that you can actually, uh, you, have a, you, have, you have a product. Instead of like, oh, I'm, I gotta get proficient in this. I also have a degree in film. And I have a lot of friends, well, I wanna future-proof this. I wanna make sure this is 8K or 4K or whatever. I'm thinking, you're never gonna show this in the cinema. No, yeah, just be happy anybody watches it on YouTube at this point. Just make something. Take your camp, take your phone, make a film. Um, and, and fortunately today you can. Uh, you can actually download apps. Uh, there's actually one app uh, for, the, for the iPad that I use that it basically uses the sound, the SID chip of the Commodore 64 to make music off of. And it was really fun to do that. And so, like, my idea, I knew this would work already because I understand how MIDI would work, but hook up a 35-year-old computer with a modern keyboard synthesizer and, and, and see it still work. So I thought that would be something interesting to do. And, um, and as the, the, this year, uh, as they just released the new spec of MIDI, uh, the, the, the MIDI, well, I don't know if they call it MIDI 2, but whatever the new version of MIDI that is coming out. And it uh, looks like there's some fascinating thing. If you think about this in, in uh, computer technology, how much stuff computer-wise do we still use that that's 35 years old? And MIDI still works. The, the software they were showing here a minute ago still works with MIDI. And for me, those people that program in MIDI were a lot smarter or a lot more future-looking uh, than the folks that made BASIC because like at the time here, Commodore 64 BASIC was different than Atari BASIC, different than Microsoft BASIC, different than Apple BASIC. It would be nice if all the basics actually work together and you could use you know, write, pro write programs basically that would work on any computer, um, but that didn't happen. But many could work on any computer. So uh, uh, for over 30 years, I've been an electronic musician. Um, I experimented with MIDI, um, various pieces of technology, samplers, uh, software, and whatnot. And I was around uh, when these 8-bit computers came out. Uh, my first 8-bit computer was Atari 400. Uh, then I got an Atari 800XL. My friends had Commodore 64s, and the Commodore 64 um, really, uh, it's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most sold personal computer. I forgot, I forgot what the, how many all together, it's, it's, it's you know, millions upon millions of, it was, I think it was also the longest produced computer as well. It was like from 82 to like 90, 92, something like that. 95, no, 95, it actually went to 95. Uh, there's a big base in Europe, uh, especially in Germany, that love these Commodore 64s. About three years back, there was a gas station in the United States that's, that was still using a Commodore 64 as a POS, as a point of to, to print out uh, you know, receipts of things. I thought, that's amazing. And this shows you how, uh, again, the computer is a computer that can, can just work. Um, so as years go by, of course, I use modern computers to create music. And uh, I do think restricting yourself uh, helps out a great deal on your creativity wise. And uh, I knew that MIDI from the, from the 80s could work uh, with devices. So if you buy any MIDI equipment from 1984, 80, uh, 86, you can work, it, it can work today with whatever modern equipment is as well. If you buy a synthesizer back then, you can use it on a modern version of software or whatever it would be a MIDI interface. Even though today, most likely, most of the MIDI interfaces are kind of gone. Uh, most of it's kind of built in with the, the USB. Um, but uh, back in the day, we definitely had uh, uh, MIDI interfaces and all that fun stuff as well. So a little bit of brief history of Commodore 64, in case uh, you don't know anything about the Commodore 64. It was introduced in 1982 uh, at the uh, Computer Electronics uh, Show. Uh, MIDI came out in 83. Uh, at NAMM's show, and uh, while at first the Commodore 64 didn't use MIDI, MIDI software and hardware was designed for it, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of the MIDI interfaces and, and whatnot. I thought about bringing the whole system down here, but I only had a 15 minute window to set up and then break down, and uh, I just didn't, uh, didn't do that. However, um, from the time um, I started doing this research, they actually came out with this little box called the, C the 64. They mainly use this for gaming. However, you can actually use some of that software on this little box because basically this is just an emulator. And of course, you can run all the software in emulation if you want to as well. And there's folks that are still actually programming for the Commodore 64. You can buy homebrew carts and put them into to bread, what I call a breadbox Commodore 64, and they work. So um, 
the Commodore 64, uh, the, the history was pretty amazing. And one of it is the SID chip uh, that basically, uh, one reason the Commodore 64 was able to be very successful is they basically in-house all their um, the, the, the processors. And, and one of the processors they made was a SID chip. And I think they sold these initially for $600, but the price point of them, of the cost was $139. So they made a pretty good profit. Then they lowered it down to $200 range, then it got down to you know $100 range by the time. And they stopped making them in 95, uh, mainly because the floppy drive costs more to make than the computer. So that just shows you how, you know, how fascinating, how fast the technology is, is come, come down some price and whatnot. And so anyways, the SID chip has uh, ability to, 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 be, to, to, to be a, a a synthesizer, and you have three sounds uh, you can use at one time there. You can mod a Commodore 64 and put another SID chip in there, and that way you have six sounds. Um, one of the challenges of using this old technology is finding hardware and software uh, to, to work. And I decided to go with, instead of finding a floppy drive and finding five and a quarter floppies that worked, and, and figured a way to download the software off the internet and put it on that. Uh, again, in Europe, there, there's a really big Commodore 64 base, and they had this little uh, SD card reader that functions as a floppy drive. The Commodore 64 sees it as a floppy drive. And uh, with a two gig card, which is the maximum you put in a two gig card, you, uh, you definitely could put every piece of software ever written for the Commodore 64 <laughs> on that. And it would be so much that you could, you could um, you know, you'd, you'd have so much space to, that you, it's un unimaginable in a lot of aspects of that. So that was the route I went with that, and that cost about uh, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. Um, and I, you can still find a vintage uh, floppy drives, it's just that I just didn't want to go through the hassle of all that. So that was one um, convention that I, I, I decided to go ahead and make my life a little bit easier just doing that. And this software is relatively easy to find off on the internet today, and uh, pretty much all of it's either public domain or, or freeware. Um, because uh, all these companies just basically you know, aren't making any money off of the Commodore 64. Uh, the, the games, of course, are still under copyright, but a lot of the software is just either, you know, just no one's made any money off of it. It's, you know, 30 years, basically, uh, 20 years. Uh, once I had the video interface working, uh, I could experiment with the sounds that came uh, with a SID chip. And um, basically, it has three note polyphony. Uh, if you guys are into synthesizers at all, we have the tack, decay, sustain, and release, um, envelopes, and, uh, and, and generators. <coughs> and basically, it means I can play a triad at a time uh, to, make, uh, to make music. And of course, I could do some multi tracking if I wanted to, to layer those sounds. And it really gave me a lot of control. Uh, it was really, uh, uh, the previous year, like I mentioned before, I used a, a synthesizer from 1980, a Roland synthesizer. Uh, System 100M. It wasn't that popular one. Um, and there was some cool freedom of being able to put these patch cables in there and do various things. And I found the Commodore 64 a lot easier to use um, with the software. Uh, the one thing about the patch cables, and also because it's voltage controlled, is that if you unplug it and plug it back in, you might have slightly different sound. And, if, and, and I've and on that particular one, if I put some patch uh, cables in there and re-put them back in there, I never got that same sound again. So I pretty much, when I came, when I designed the sound that I wanted, I just went back and um, I just recorded everything at that point, left it plugged in, and um, just kind of went from there. Um, I see anything else uh, big about that there. Uh, one of the problems that I haven't been able to conquer with the Commodore 64, I don't, I don't think there's a possibility that. Either I could use the Commodore 64 as a, a MIDI sequencer, or I can use it to, to create sound. I guess the only way around that is if I got two Commodore 64s, use one basically kind of like a, as the sound mo module, and then one actually record the MIDI information. Um, so <coughs> basically this album here, I because I wanted the sounds from the Commodore 64, I just recorded it live uh, into, uh, into the computer, basically. So anyways, uh, I already mentioned this with, with using older uh, technology with your creativity. I think in a lot of ways using older equipment can help spur your creativity in. Uh, and I, I've never been one of those like, well, you need the newest, fastest thing to, to be able to do things. 
Uh, could I make music? Could I score a film with a Commodore 64? Yes, I could. Uh, if you want to do notation, it's limited by the day standards, but you could print out parts uh, on the Commodore 64. Um, a lot of computer assisted instruction that stuff is available on the Commodore 64. So again, it just it's just sitting there waiting for you to uh, input the information. So if you want to learn intervals or do some basic uh, oral skills, uh, or, uh, you can definitely do that very easily. Um, I think I talked about everything else, basically. The limitation of using the technology really helped me and uh, made me think of things a different way. So there's some promotional pictures I, I took with this for the CD and whatnot. And uh, let's see that. Put it over here. Actually, I think it's over here. But I'll just show you the, the physical copy of the CD, uh, which I haven't even opened open up because uh, nobody listens to CDs anymore. Uh, but I wanted to make a, 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 a CD that um, is on Amazon, um, and uh, there it is. So I, took, I, I always want to make sure, I make sure I have some album art to go along with it and everything. So this picture here, you can see the, this bread box, Commodore 64, and there's a MIDI interface there, and it, go, and it plugs into the cartridge uh, area. So for some of you all that weren't around, uh, the Commodore, uh, Atari 2600 had cartridges you put in there, and that's how you get your programs. And there were a very small amount of information you could put on those uh, in comparison to a, a floppy drive or even a cassette uh, uh, tape drive as well. Uh, so this, this, was, this was the first one. Once, once I got that, meant I could go and actually uh, do this research and, and, and make music with a Commodore 64. So there's kind of the setup I had here. Uh, you can see I actually have a Radio Shack tape deck. Uh, over here, it, it's, it's kind of buried, but that's the cassette deck that, that, I, that came with this that I could store information on it that way. And I did type in some programs in there to see if it works, and it still works. Uh, funny thing, uh, side note, in the US, we mainly use floppy drives. Well, I guess in Europe, that never caught on. They, they always use, they use uh, cassette uh, tapes. And Interesting, you could actually load a program faster with a cassette deck with, with this piece of soft with this piece of cart you would put in there, this fast loader, than you could with a floppy drive. So and that was that was kind of interesting to, to note. Um, but uh, I, I got some speakers there, have the little joystick there. Right there is the, the floppy drive that has the SD card on it. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll have some closer closer pictures of that. And there's a cart. There's a, this is a regular cartridge right there uh, that you plug in. And that's actually a music piece of software that came, uh, came with the Commodore 64. So there is a, a, a modern a keyboard that came from um, the year 2000. Actually, I think we bought that model, um, yeah, about the 2000 range. And uh, you can kind of see the setup here. And so basically, I mentioned before, uh, doing this kind of research, I, I, I do a lot of stuff with old Macintosh computers for uh, um, sequencing, um, of course, with the Commodore 64 here. I may do this with an Apple II, just because I never did uh, use MIDI with the Apple II, and I think that might be really interesting to try that. Uh, the, the, someone mentioned a, a Trash 80, TRS 80. Um, I'm not sure if MIDI worked with that or not, but it may have. I know they had, like, I believe they had a sound uh, synthesizer a voice synthesizer on it, if I remember right. Uh, but that might be interesting. And like a lot of this stuff I used to pick up pretty cheap in, in uh, thrift stores, but uh, now some of the stuff is kind of retro. It's a little hard to, to get a hold of. And the one thing with the, for the Commodore 64, it's so old, you can see it right here. This brick here, this is, that's the thing that fills the most on the Commodore 64. And so companies actually sell those. Uh, and uh, it's, it's weird how the voltage actually worked on it. So if you, get, if you, if you did want to use a real one, you may want to update that. I always unplug the Commodore 64 because I didn't want to leave it in there as a possible fire hazard or whatever. So I, when I used it, I used it when I was, when I was gone. I, I unplugged it. And, uh, so anyways, I already kind of mentioned all this stuff here. But th this, is the, this is the hardware that I was using. And I needed an analog TV set. Um, I'm sure I could have figured out some way to hook up 
to, to HDMI, <coughs> but I just got a flat screen TV that worked as a, the old analog ones that aren't, that's not, sort, it's not really 100% digital. Um, and I did that just so I could carry it around easier, some of those big CTR TVs and whatnot. I still got one left that I used for a Commodore, for an Atari a 2600, because <coughs> there is something playing games on that that looks differently than it does on a big flat screen, on a flat screen TVs. Um, the refresh rate's different and everything, and even if you try to emulate it, it's not quite the same. And I did get too many interfaces. Uh, some of the software were better with one interface than the other one. And I don't know if it was designed that way, or I believe it was designed that way, or if some of it's so old that this, is, this is, doesn't work anymore. It's not working at 100%. I think it's the first. I think that they actually updated the interfaces as time went, as time went by. And uh, I want to do this with, a, with an Atari 800 XL. I just can't find any interfaces for those at all. I just can't find any of those. So if anybody knows where I can get a uh, MIDI interface for Atari, the, the Amigas obviously had, I think had the MIDI interfaces built into them. And Amigas were like these, the, the, the big MIDI computer, um, especially in the 90s. I don't know, you're shaking your head yes on, on that. <laughs> the Ataris, I believe, uh, the next step up, the STs had MIDI also on it and them as well. So you can find one for the 800. Uh, Steinberg uh, Research, this is the <coughs> piece of software that's vintage from 85, and they had it available to, to use, and they even had a manual on there, thank goodness, to kind of figure out what's going on. Once, once I got it to play it, to record something and to play it back, I was like, yes, yes, this is so great. This is great, this is great. Um, and uh, the rest of the software that I'm using to actually use it as, as a uh, synthesizer is relatively modern. Uh, I believe this, this software was written from someone from Russia. Um, it's 2005. Let's see, was it uh, Rotosky? Retrosky. <coughs> the synth cart, I really liked a great deal, and uh, it was first designed in uh, 2006. And, uh, and this one's relatively new. Uh, the station 64. So those, that's the, those are the pieces of the software that I use. So here's a little closer pictures of the MIDI interface. So there's a little switch there um, and sometimes things would, when I first plugged it in it would work. Then if I re, if I, if I back in the day the way you change programs you turn off the computer. You turn it back on uh, it, I had to throttle that switch off or, or, and then throttle throw it back on to, to have it work. Uh, I had a little reminders of some of the cheap uh, notes to be the type of the Commodore 64, the loads, things like that, so I had that there. And you see that's where the, the, the cart is. Normally the cart only sticks out a little bit, but obviously the MIDI interface is a lot more. You see the MIDI cables going in there, the MIDI in, the MIDI out. And this is another one here. You can see the MIDI in, MIDI out, and uh, MIDI through. If you ever if you ever used those uh, back in the day, so that was one of the things that uh, when we first started using MIDI, MIDI in goes to MIDI out. I can't tell you how many times people did MIDI in to MIDI in, and it just what, this wouldn't work. And later on, they finally designed one that said two MIDI in, two MIDI out, and that made it a little easier for folks to figure out how to get, get to actually get it going. So there's some of the programs that uh, that you had to actually type in there. Uh, the load program, load uh, program, comma eight. Eight I uh, meant uh, to read from the floppy disk. And then uh, you have to type in run and then press the return key then the, the program would actually work. So unlike today where everything's a GUI interface or everything just works, uh, you actually, actually had to type in stuff to make it, uh, to make things work. And uh, the one thing that was, uh, I'll show you a little footage of this, how fast the Commodore 64 boots in comparison to computers today. I mean, it's just, you know, just spot on um, and in a lot of aspects. Uh, you can see also here, there's some cartridges there. I had my, I had the book on my uh, iPad there so I can read the, uh, the information to, to kind of dig through the manual and figure out uh, how to use this software. And uh, there's a handful of us out there that, that make music uh, with, a, with a Commodore 64, so. You can see I'm playing in a note into this uh, sequencing software. So let me let me play a little uh, footage since I wasn't able to bring uh, the Commodore 64. 
kind of directly. So let me see, let's see if the audio works. That's as loud as it gets. Okay, maybe. Oh, what's yours? Here. Okay. The Commodore 64. Here is the cartridge port back here. Um, here are so we plug it into the TV. That's with the TV. Some areas for the disk drive and some other spots over here. Spots over there. And so that's all, you know, it's, it's neat. That's all one board, you know, on, on the Commodore 64. That's one board. Set drive, two <coughs> ports for um, joysticks. And, and those joysticks are the same. Uh, you could put an Atari 2600 joystick in there, although the voltage was a little bit different. They worked, a, the paddles worked a little bit different. Power and then the turn on switch. This is the part, this is the MIDI interface. This is the part you have to have if you're trying to do uh, some MIDI with your Commodore 64. So as you can see here, so. You can see the on switch, the through, it has a little diagram there. Um, and uh, I was very thankful to find that, that one. Uh, I'm, 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 I don't know quite sure why someone put it on eBay, but I'm happy they did. And uh, I'm happy that my US dollars converted to euros or whatever Germany uses. Yeah, some things on basically there is the cartridge part. And, you, and probably a lot of these have gotten destroyed because you know that's it's not too fragile but I can see that breaking off very easily because that's basically the cart sticking out. I pull another cartridge out and you can kind of see in there kind of the size of the cartridge. So you can see the well a little bit you can see the MIDI the, the five DIN if you are into using MIDI. Uh, MIDI in and then uh, a couple places for MIDI out and a MIDI three. Uh, this is a SD card and it goes up to two gigs, as, as big as a, you, you can uh, uh, put in there. That goes into the floppy drive uh, area on the Commodore 64. And this actually goes, gets the, some electricity from the game port. And it, where you, you can put in another joystick you want, to the joystick port, basically. I'm, I'm, to me, it's really fascinating that whoever designed this figured out, well, let's just get, this is cybering some uh, electricity from the Commodore 64. So they could have, it may have been better if they use a you know, USB to, to power it, but it, it works. And so on here, it basically works as a floppy drive. It sees it as uh, you can have it set, you can use two different disks in there as well. You can, so you, you have to run your program and have another floppy in there and use that as uh, the place where you store your data. But back in the day, some software was so big, you had to have put in multiple floppies. A lot of y'all probably never had to deal with that. But uh, uh, it basically functioned as a uh, floppy drive for the Commodore 64. So basically, let's hook up the Commodore 64 and get some mini work. So I did a little time lapse showing the process of, I'm sure back in the day, I could have been a little bit faster going through manuals and so I type in load those that use common 64s know, know this already and I type in the name of the program so go down yeah, for some reason I'll type as fast on the common 64 and then put a comma and eight tells it it's the floppy drive and hit return it's searching for uh, the boot driver software and I tell it to run and so now it's loading this information up. And there so there, there is uh, some software running on from 1985. Uh, so I think that's fascinating to me. So now I got a mini sequencer right here ready to use. So let's go over to a blank track. So if you look at this here, I wish that it was a little bit brighter. Um, basically, you see uh, one through 16 tracks there. And you see the green is on. And basically, I got to type in the, the, uh, where I wanted the channel to go. Mini channel 10, if some of y'all remember back in the day, that was the drum channel. So the record drums, you, you pretty much, uh, for, with basic MIDI, general MIDI, MIDI channel 10 was the, the, the drum channel. Most people don't know that today. But, um, and so I, I, to make my life easier, I just kind of always put 10, MIDI channel, uh, track 10 is MIDI channel 10 and whatnot. So I'll turn that on, and then I, I, I could, I could uh, tell it uh, uh, how many measure, how many bar, I mean, what time signature I wanted, uh, what tempo I wanted as well. 
something that didn't have anything on it. So let's see. And so no mouse control, you do basically just use the arrows up and down, or, white or the F, the function keys. The first thing keys. I want to do is I'm going to change the tempo. So I'm shifting up and down to get two various things. And so I'll just change that to, let's say, 108. And if I want to, I can change that from two bars, four bars, or 12 bars, or whatever. I can change it to a different time signature if I want to. I'll just give it 4 4 right now. So it's a, it's relatively in, intuitive once you kind of get over the fact you can't use a mouse. Make sure my drums are working. If you understand how MIDI functions. So right there, that, that was a good day. Once I saw that little area there was spike up uh, because that meant it was the MIDI input was going into the Commodore 64. You see, I'm getting some MIDI in and MIDI out, which is exactly what I want. So I hit R to record, One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Forgive my drumming. All right, so it's, and it's playing back. Now that's not a sound from the Commodore 64, it's just the sequence. Because again, uh, it, the Commodore 64 it didn't have the ability to be able to play audio and sequence at the same time. Hit stop there. So if I want to, what I'm going to do is to quantize something uh, on here after you after you've done something. Um, I'll show the quantize because it's kind of interesting. To the quantize box. Okay. Make sure we got it, the quantize that I want. And if you don't know what quantize is, it pulls it on the beat right there. If you're off, press the, the pound key there. Okay. And that's the. And it, has a, it had a weird number scene because it didn't make quite sense with quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes. But I can't wait. Go keys to type in because I haven't used Commodore 64 in a while. All right, so you can notice that little dot comes on there. If I hit it again, so it goes away. Or hit it's by the off kind of button. You can't see it on the screen there, but and then put the track, put it over the track I want. Right there. And then um, hit the pounce. Just hit return. And this here, see if it plays it. So I play through it once. So by today's standards, this is really archaic. You know, this is really slow. This really takes a lot of time. But honestly, today, it, you could do any, if you're trying to sequence, you can do the same things back on an 8 bit computer that you could on a modern computer today. Uh, Honestly, they mostly folks are using so loops today. <coughs> Just kind of show you. So I'm using four. the sounds from the roll in there. Computer, make sure it's on the mid channel four. And this track's kind of lame, so it's just hang in there. It just go up. And then turn. Okay. Alright. And so now I'm ready to record. So hit R to record. So one measure, two measures for nothing. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Two, three, four. So I know y'all, you're probably not super amazed, but I was so happy with this work. I was like, yes, yes, this MIDI technology is working with this old computer, yes. So uh, this basically was a fun summer to, to, to experiment around with that. Uh, I teach during the year, obviously. Uh, so I, I usually do my research in the summer when I got some time to set up things and uh, not grading wow. papers well, and things like that. that came in a little too early. Anyways, let me fast forward just a little bit. You, so let me show you some other software that is not uh, sequence based, but it basically uses the Commerce 64 as a, as a sound module. Or as a synthesizer. Um, wave controls, all these different things, and in all of them down, I pick the sounds. So that there, I'm using the MIDI keyboard there to play the sounds from the Commodore 64. Which I think is pretty cool as well. Some of the software has it where you play the keys, the, the keyboard, and and but I'm a piano player. And I, I, I'm used to playing the piano, the keys, that feel, not 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 A or you know the chord key. And if I hit uh, F2, it will help me figure out what I what I can do with various things. So the cool thing about
about this, this software here is, is modern, so that whoever, the, the folks that, that program it, actually make it a little easier, it's a little bit more intuitive, and they have help screens on there to help you figure out how to actually use this in different ways. There's three oscillators in here, so different waveforms for those. So you get the idea with that one. And then uh, I, I load another piece of software. The next time I do that, I got. All right. So now I can, this particular one here, I can, I, this is, I, this, this, I have to use the keyboard, the, the typewriter keyboard to play sounds. And this one actually works in emulation. So if you want to download an emulator, uh, you actually. So this is the emulator. And I'll just show you for, for fun. Uh, this particular one's called X64. I think it works on Mac and PC. And just add a uh, um, let's see if I want to do like the synth cart. And types it in for you. So that's kind of nice. And then. And they use the function key. So I'm on my laptop here. I hit, hit the FN. And I can change the octave. Uh, so, you know, honestly, if you guys want to go home and experiment with this, you, can, you, don't, need any, you don't need a real Commodore 64. You can use this in emulation. And uh, just kind of have a have a fun time and record your own CD of a vintage uh, Commodore 64 sounds and everything. Um, sadly, I only have two US ports. Uh, I was able to get one of these programs to work with a MIDI keyboard, uh, somewhat. It, it was a little flaky, uh, but it worked a little bit. And uh, probably because the emulation folks uh, aren't really uh, thinking about. And you, can, and you can change various things on there. Uh, if I hit return, it gives you a pretty detailed help screen there, uh, which is which is nice. And let's, so let's say I want to do um, okay. The the space is the bender, right? And the cursor key is the fifth on and off. Okay. So. I think that's some cool stuff. What was the fist, what was the fist again? The space bar was that? Shift. Shift? Okay. The cursor keys. Anyways, you can you, you can go through here and experiment around with this, and I think it's uh, I think it's some really fun uh, stuff to do as well. Uh, if you guys would bear with me, uh, I don't know if anybody has any interest in buying one of these things. They, they, this last Christmas, I was happy to see these everywhere. They, I think they were like ninety nine dollars, and they were like they went down to like sixty bucks. I think they were down to like as much as fifty dollars, and I'm sure you can still get one. If you notice, I have a uh, this little USB. Uh, uh, extender here, basically. So I have the, on the thumb drive. It allows you to be able to um, input um, software there. So I'm not quite sure if this is actually going to work, uh, but I'll plug it in if you guys will indulge me for a second and see if I can actually get this thing to work. Turn it on. Turn it off. Sadly, this the, this little mini one, the keyboard doesn't work. So you have to use a USB keyboard. Doing this thing live. I'm not quite sure if it's going to if it, if it, if it is see it or not. But I'll, I'll just say if it doesn't work, I'll just tell you it does. Uh, it's an emulator, just like the software, like the computer, and so you can run the same programs on it. I was just going to show you how to use the the joystick and everything to get to everything, but.
Oh, you know what? I know it did it. I plugged it in wrong. I plugged the wrong one in. That's what. Here we go. Dun, dun, dun. It's going to work. This is some positive vibes. This is a positive. I know it's going to work. I can feel it. Yeah, winch. Ah, there we go. Now you see the little USB thing. And then on here. And there's three versions of this software that they make. And all this stuff, the stuff, the, the stuff that's made recently, it's, just, it's open for people to, to download. You can buy the carts, but they also realize that people you know, are going to do the emulation. And I'm trying to remember if that's the one. You can emulate it on the Pi. On the Pi? Yeah. So I just got a standard USB, you know, an old computer I, uh, uh, that I had, and well. So for fifty dollars and a couple of USB dongles, you too can make music on the Commodore 64. Uh, your your kids. You, some people can see this is a video game, but some of the sounds that does, doesn't work, like. Like uh, the filter bass, I can't. I, I don't know what why it doesn't work. On the on the the bread box one, it works. On the real Commodore 64, it works. But there's a couple of them. So you change the octaves on there. Anyways, so um, if you want to get out, you just hit exit game, even though it's not really a game, and then go back there. Let's, let's load up another piece of software. Here's that one that, that uh, the one that doesn't work with a MIDI keyboard anyways. So I don't know. I don't know if you guys are think it's cool, but I think it's kind of cool that you can run this stuff in emulation, and you have a little fake Commodore 64 connected to your, your, your high-def television and, uh, and make beats, you know, and record, make a whole, uh, whole uh, That's the sequencer, right? No, this is, this is this another uh, um, uh, synthesizer. Uh, the sequencer, you can pull it up, but I, I can't get, get it to work with a, a MIDI uh, interface. Now, they, they update stuff. Uh, this is the sequencer here. There's one of them that works and one of them doesn't work. Let me try that one again. So, it looks like it's working. At least it wants to work. Types in the, the load the information or whatnot. It's good. And there it is. That's a that that company still exists today. That's the one that makes uh, you know, Cubase or uh, and I think it's still loading. Maybe maybe it just can't find anything on it. I thought I got it to boot. You know. Anyways. Anyway, so you can actually go through here. I, I, I think it's kind of cool. You can go through here and actually use a, a Commodore 64 emulator uh, to be able to make uh, to make music and whatnot. Any questions on any, any, on this one at all? If you if you were in, if you if you're savvy enough to move a joystick around and put a USB drive and read a few things and 
download some software, you can you can get to work relatively easy and whatnot. So I'll see my kind of in this PowerPoint presentation. A few more things. Hopefully it comes back up. If not, we got to see the Commodore 64 emulator going on. There we go. So I'll stop making beats there. And uh, basically, I have two videos that I did on this process. And um, um, surprisingly, because they're actually a pretty, I, I'm on a couple, I'm on a couple boards on uh, on uh, Facebook that are in the Commodore 64s. And um, I think some of them watch the videos or just they're interested in that as well. So kind of sum, sum everything up. I think it's amazing that it uses 35-year-old technology um, and it can still be used by electronic musicians. And you can emulate it to mimic, uh, today you can emulate uh, Commodore 64s. However, using a real red box Commodore 64 and mini interface really made this uh, more visceral, more real. Um, and I'll be honest, most of the time it worked. If not, I just, I just turned the computer off and turned it back on and it worked. Most of the time. Um, and uh, look at the processing speed back then. 64K of RAM and 1.023 megahertz CPU. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think that my phone here is like a million times faster than that, something like that, potentially, cycles per second wise. But again, if we, if, we, if we think about computers, again, one big computer can do anything that a bazillion big computer can do, just slower. And uh, why not? So the, uh, today, the, the most economical cell phones have more than that. So you can see, see all that as well. So there's some references. Uh, I got down the last couple ones that are actually linked to some of those, that software, if you're curious about that. Um, if you send me out an email, I can send you uh, some, some links as well. And, uh, I don't know if there's any questions from any of y'all or anybody experimenting around with doing any uh, using eight-bit computers to make music. I believe you can uh, on Atari 2600. You, there's some abilities for making music with that. Uh, Nintendo. I think there's some uh, there's definitely some abilities with that potentially. Uh, I don't think there's any MIDI in it. They, they had something called a Miracle Piano, which one a couple y'all remember with that. That was basically a MIDI interface in there. You. Shoot ducks with notes, basically, and things like that. They had other games in that. Um, but uh, any, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Can you play us a sample of the music you created? Yeah, yeah, I can. It's it, it's definitely avant, you know, experimental stuff that I'm. It's, it's not for. Um, I wouldn't say it's it's not. It's not EDM. No, it's 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 definitely. Uh, very e e experimental uh, electronic music. Uh, let's see. I put that up there. You know, I may have it up here. No. Yeah, let, me, let me look for a second. I know I can find it in a second. Yeah, just so you can sort of hear a little bit of this. There it is, okay, good. All right, so here, hold your ears.
That's a good question. I I assume it's twenty to twenty thousand. I'm assuming. Um, yeah. It's different, you know. Again, this is not someone you're not dancing to this, you're not jamming to this. Like you said, the electronic like dance music. That's what people tend to do. This for. I'm a I'm a hard classical composer, you know. Uh, there's some settings on there to do, and, I, I, and I'll be honest, it's a little easier to do this on the, Com on the Commodore 64 itself uh, than, than, than on emulation, because the keyboard, it's all set up for, the, it, I mean, it's written for the Commodore 64 bread box and, and emulators and things like that, but you, if you want to do it through emulation, you could do all this via emulation as well. Um, but it's, 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 it was really cool. Uh, it's really cool to do this kind of research. Like I mentioned before, if I did a sci-fi film, these are some sounds that I can use for a sci-fi film very easily. Do you, do you have a, a selection of waveforms, or you're generating all your own waveforms? Uh, I'm I'm using the, the software there to make the waveforms, okay. and then I, I record it uh, usually right there, so that way I have to write it down and remember it. Is uh, it uh, synthesis, or is it tracked, or you know, I think the, uh, that's a good question. I think it's additive. I think it's additive. But you know, I don't know for sure. I should know that. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I knew it at one point. <laughs> and, and, and one thing when you do this research, I mean, I, I did this back, again, I'm not trying, uh, I did this in, in 2017. So by the time for me to do po posters or do presentations, uh, it's been a while. If I had to bring a box one, it's, it would take me a while to relearn it again. I don't remember the software that well. Now that the, that month of, of in, in the studio space that I had, I knew it pretty well, and I would I would be up there six eight hours a, a night uh, recording and uh, just experimenting with different sounds and everything. Yes, yes sir. Um, are the videos on YouTube? Yeah. If you if you type in Herbert Midgley, um, as a matter of fact, if you guys. I can use more subscribers if you like to subscribe. You don't have to. Uh, I'm the internet legend, and uh, that's one I put up the other day. And uh, actually, I, I, it, I, the other one, other couple, I got like a couple hundred people watching it uh, and whatnot. So if you guys give me like four more subscribers, that would be rock. That would totally drive worth coming down to San Antonio just for that by itself. <laughs> I was trying to get to ten thousand because at ten thousand, there's some cool stuff you can do with YouTube. And I've been on YouTube for twelve years. And uh, I have 4,000 videos on there. So if you just type in Herbert Midgley, Commodore 64, I'm sure they pop up. And then uh, I, I got three, I think at least three of them on there. And whatnot. So I, we're, I think we're getting pretty close. Any other questions you all have or any comments? If you guys want, want a card, I'll give you all a card if you want to send me out an email or um, uh, same contact if you guys create some, some stuff. And I'm really uh, thankful for time that to, to, to gave this opportunity for me to come talk about this research. And uh, again, I'll throw this video on, the, on YouTube and have some more folks uh, hear about this as well. I, the, I saw another conference, it was similar, that they're, they're doing Commodore 64 music things and there's a handful of us that like to experiment with different things, older things, and I think it's really, it works out pretty well in a lot of aspects. There you go, <laughs> you found it. <laughs> so I, I plan to do some more computer uh, archaeology things uh, with OS 9. Some of y'all remember OS 9. There's still some software back then that was better than some of the software that's out today. There's still some very cool things. I actually bought the, the fastest G4 uh, tower to, to make a, an audio. They make a DAW system, make an audio system out of it. Um, and so. Uh, so anyways, it's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot more research. And again, like I mentioned before, I think well, Apple doing Apple II, uh, if I can find some for the, for the TRS-80, that would be really fascinating, or for some, some other early computers. The Commodore 64 was is easier because there was so many of them. And I just don't, if, I just can't find MIDI interfaces for other things. If, if you are having to run into a MIDI interface for some obscure uh, computer systems, send me, please send me out an email. Just while you were talking, I got on eBay, and somebody had three Commodores, with two disk drives and two interfaces and software for 450. 450. <laughs> That's a little bit of a price point because I, I, I think I got the Commodore 64 
for 20 bucks at, at, the, at the thrift store and then like 50 bucks for that and then, then another. So I'm like in a 150 buck range <laughs> to, 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 to make that. So, uh, no, that's cool though, that's cool. So uh, at one point you could get, like I mentioned before, you could get that stuff really cheap because nobody wanted it. They were just getting clearing out of their house. Now it's a little bit more retro or harder to find. Um, I keep hope, uh, and this company is gonna make a full version of this actually with a typewriter that works. And uh, so when that comes out, you'll be able to at least play the uh, MIDI on the, on the typewriter on, on that box on your computer and whatnot. So great Christmas presents and everything. Thank you all so much for coming out. You guys have been a great audience and everything. And, uh, hope you have a great rest of time here at TVA and time. Well, that went pretty quick.